$1,000 per megabit per month for dedicated bandwidth versus $900 in the U.S. fiber network. Satellite is best used as a broadcast medium to send the same multimedia contact to many, even hundreds or thousands of locations for the same cost as fiber to one location. This is where satellite is very competitive. It is also very effective in serving rural areas and parts of the world that are, are at a distance from the fiber backbone. And again, the growth in the satellite sector is in direct-to-home TV and Internet, along with geolocation services, mobile Internet, and radio services. In summary, the telecommunications market continues to grow despite loss of confidence by investors in high-tech stocks and political turmoil around the world. Companies like WorldCom will continue to provide service while they go through bankruptcy. The major growth will be in the local level, connecting individual clients to the telecommunications backbone. There will be little investment in fiber facilities between countries. Satellite will continue steady growth based on geostationary satellites. Packet networks, like the Internet, will begin to surpass the traditional circuit-switched networks. Wireless personal communication services and local area networks will grow faster than local lines. CATV uh, telephone and Internet services will continue to be a major competitive force in the local markets. In closing, I would like to say that being informed and up to date with the developments of the global telecommunications network is a must for managers, professionals, and citizens today, given the many benefits in productivity and quality of life that these technologies are capable of providing. There are many sources of information and organizations that can provide their stakeholders with continuous updating in the area, these areas without becoming technologists or scientists in the field. Organizations in all fields, whether in education, business, or government, are finding that they must increase utilization of network structures supported by telecommunications infrastructure if they want to be competitive and successful. Thank you very much. Let's begin with a first question and answer session. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that only one question be asked per phone call, and that these questions be as brief as possible. You may call the studio directly on the phone numbers or fax which appear on your screen. We remind you to make your phone calls at a distance from the monitor to avoid feedback. Now I believe we have our first uh, caller from uh, the Federación Nacional de Comerciantes in Medellín, Colombia. Come in, please. Buenos días. Buenos días. According to studies, in 2006, the emails uh, will double from 31 to 61 million a day. Also, another study um, done by San Diego that uh, monitors the internet and uh, traffic in businesses said that they thought that the news in internet was very um, appealing in internet as well as internet shopping and 18 percent thought that pornography was interesting and um, another person thought that um, online betting or auctioning as well. And this means that there is uh, progress in communication. My question is, is there not some sort of de decrease in time, work time that is, that isn't related to the, the work responsibilities in place? What, what are your comments on this? What about that gentleman? The dark side, perhaps, of the Internet. Uh, does it uh, distract and uh, occupy people at work? Well, for me, it, it's uh, actually been quite a, um, a boon because um, rather than have to deal with a lot of um, interruptions, I can go through my email. I get like 60 emails a day. Uh, I get probably 20 newsletters. And so I can quickly glance through the newsletters rather than read the publications. 
it's been a tremendous uh, boon and actually uh, makes my day more efficient. I'm sure that's true for many people, but is, does there not have to be some policy in the workplace about personal use of the Internet? Yeah, absolutely, and the uh, the fact that there is no veil of privacy uh, for commercial email, I think that's impressed quite often in my company. Yeah. Email is like broadcasting in absolutely. a way, not really a private medium at all. All right, we've got another caller now from Panama, from uh, the Universidad Tecnológica de Panama. Your question, please. I would like to send my salutations from Panama to the world. In regard to telecommunications in our country, this uh, we have a fiber optics a node in our country. This is a super highway of telecommunications. The question is, what do you think it would be convenient to develop in our country to have an optimum use of telecommunications in our country, in Panama, that is? So for Panama, Fiber optics the way to go, or does that depend? I really think that you can leapfrog the uh, requirement for infrastructure uh, implementation in many of these developing countries through the use of wireless technology. Okay, I, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, it gives you broadband connectivity very quickly with a minimum of implementation time. Right. Japan, for instance, has broadband to uh, the doorstep. Uh, throughout the country, or at least a plan for that. Is that unwise given the alternatives? Well, I think it, it really depends on whether you've got rights of way, for instance, and, and whether you can get those lines installed. Um, but with the increasing um, availability of bandwidth technology over a given medium, uh, I think you use what you have, and then if you don't have it, you implement via wireless. All right, I think we have a caller from Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, come in, please. In this satellite integration in wireless system and cable and the chain effect that this, um, in, that this happened, who had the initiative to continue with this uh, strategy? Because we know that it was not easy. Thank you. Okay, the effect of, I guess, one technology causing the need for other technologies. How, how did that come about? Well, I think that uh, the advent of uh, fiber has uh, also caused the need for wireless local distribution because, again, uh, the fiber was built, and not, but not the on-ramps uh, to the fiber, if you will, the connect local connectivity. Uh, Internet is, uh, was never designed for the distribution of multimedia content. So satellite oftentimes is necessary to leapfrog the, the fiber in order to deliver content. All right. Well, welcome to a caller from Cuba, from Sienta Internet in Habana, Cuba. Come in, please. This is very interesting. You know that our company, Senialten, is really on the vanguard of the services in, in our country. Our question has to do with the following. Are there positive opportunities with in countries that are not as developed to really take advantage of the Internet? What are the advantages of these type of countries, countries like Cuba? What kind of opportunities will this technology bring us? Thank you very much. So again, opportunities for lesser developed countries. Certainly the Internet is making the world a smaller place. Um, and uh, I think the opportunities abound when you look at uh, where some businesses in, uh, in not only the U.S. but all over the world are actually doing business from physically. Uh, you'll see that the Internet is making a huge impact on the, uh, on the ability and the, the availability of commerce. And really, you're talking about earlier leapfrogging. In a way, mm -hmm. not having all the infrastructure to uh, create or maintain could be an advantage for some of these countries that could, for instance, go to a worldwide uh, wireless uh, uh, type technology. Am I right about that? Exactly. Uh, they don't have a, a legacy network to try to protect they can jump immediately into the latest technology. So we have all those sunk costs and they can start afresh. Right. And it gives them uh, access to the entire world instantly, something that uh, is just mind-boggling, even to me. <laughs> sure.
Very good. Well, we have a, a, a caller from Mexico, from uh, the Universidad uh, Liceo uh, Cervantino. Uh, come in, please. My question is, how can the, a small business use and acquire a technology as a way of a directive technology as a man, in a manager standpoint? This is expensive and, and how and sometimes these world-class technologies are too big. We, we are small and medium-sized business leaders here. How can we use this technology in our businesses? Who'd like to try that one? Well, uh, let me point out that uh, wireless local area network um, technology, uh, prices are dropping like a rock. Uh, and uh, units are available here locally for uh, $150 uh, for a plug-in for a uh, laptop PC, and the master station is under $300. So I think that's affordable in most areas of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've had many meetings with customers that ask the exact same question, sure. and I tell them all it's a, ma it's a matter of prioritization. Look at, uh, at the technologies you have implemented and look at the available technologies and then make your decisions based on productivity gains. Well, thanks, gentlemen, and thank you for your excellent questions, listeners. Uh, now we're going to move to the second module of our program and be back with some more questions later. Thank you. The message that I have to give to you today applies to all types of businesses and organizations. In fact, during my career, I've worked not only in the healthcare sector, but in the government and commercial sectors as well. One of the things that I'd like to talk to you about today is convergence. Convergence is here. Some solid international standards have helped this convergence along with the fact that bandwidth and the needs for bandwidth are increasing. I'd also like to cover a couple of case studies in the section of my presentation that I like to call out in the real world. These are healthcare case studies. However, I think you'll find that they apply not only to the healthcare sector, but also to your sector. I'd like to give you a little bit of integration advice by talking about things that I've found to be very beneficial over the years in terms of selecting an integrator. I'd also like to provide some additional details on vendor selection. Technology for technology's sake is non-productive, I've found. Technology can be distracting. I think we miss opportunities by focusing on the bits and bytes of the technology. And really what we want to do is apply technology in a productive way in ways that create a sustainable competitive advantage in business or provide better patient care when you're talking about health care. And also doing things that make business sense, not things that are done just simply because the technology is available. Convergence is here. Televisions, VCRs, PCs, personal digital assistants, and the cell phone. I think you look at a TV today, you look at a computer today, and you say, which is it, a computer or a TV? Well, in many cases, and these devices are coming together, digital recorders and VCRs are available and out there. They have and will provide you with literally gigabytes of storage capacity to do the things that you want to do, recording voice, video, and data. DVD recorders are readily available now. We're using them in our business to stream captured video from surgery, for instance. But they can be used in your business to capture motion video and audio, and also still images. Storage these days is also more stable than it has ever been in high capacity CD recording devices and CD record write devices. That combined with some of the new wireless technologies that are out and available, and also with new ones that are in the development process, such as third generation cell phones, these technologies allow you to really communicate in a multimedia format and will really aid you in getting the message across. They will help you develop the strategic advantage you want for your company or for your organization. The third generation cell phones are a perfect example of non-productive versus productive technologies. 3G cell phones allow you to play games, for instance, which is probably not the way that you want to apply the technology to a business case. But they're also interesting in, in terms of, but they're also interesting advantages in terms of third generation cell phones for text messaging. And then, of course, personal digital assistants or PDAs. PDAs come in the form of cell phones. Cell phones come in the form of PDAs. We use PDA cell phones. We use text pagers. We use tablet-based PCs. 
Now all of these are converging to allow ubiquitous communication wherever you happen to be. Being at your desk, or around the facility, or around town, and around the world. And the thing that's led to this convergence is the development of some solid international standards, namely the Internet Protocol Standard in terms of transmission, and the XGA display capability, high resolution displays on your PCs, on your PDAs, on your laptops, and soon on your television. Along with Internet Protocol, we have new standards in quality of service. Quality of service as a method of determining how quickly and how efficiently Internet Protocol based digital packets are shipped around a network. And standards for IP called H.323, which is the IP video standard, and H.320, which is the ISDN video standard. All are ubiquitous and available and have become the de facto standards in terms of transmission of not only bidirectional video, but also of voice and data. And once that video, voice, and data gets to your converged device, it's got to be displayed. And thankfully, there are the XGA and higher resolution graphics standards, which are being widely adopted in all of these converged devices that we've talked about. And of course, standards such as NTSC and PAL, which are television standards. HDTV, DVI, SDI are all transmission standards associated with video and audio. In my business, we're using MPEG-1, 2, and 4 for motion video, and then JPEG, and to a lesser extent, motion JPEG, for the transmission of still images. These are solid standards. They're out there. They're being adopted by virtually every manufacturer that's making a mass-produced video or multimedia device. And through the use of both the IP transmission standards and the XGA display standards, we allow multiple devices to not only communicate with each other, but also display the images and other pieces of multimedia that are necessary to really get your message across. To link all those devices, we need more bandwidth. What I'd like to do now is just take you quickly through some technologies that are available for transmitting this rich multimedia. Switch technologies include dial-up, which will allow transmission at up to 56 kilobits. Cellular transmission can go from about 5 kilobits per second to about 100 kilobits per second. And this is quite an increase over typical cell phones. And now, because of these standards, allow you to transmit video and audio much more efficiently. The ISDN standards, BRI ISDN, stands for Basic Rate Interface and is available virtually worldwide. BRI allows 128 kilobit per second switch transmission. This allows high-speed file transfer between converged devices and also bidirectional motion video and audio. Primary rate interface ISDN, PRI ISDN, also allows about 12 times the transmission capability of basic rate ISDN. We use PRI ISDN lines in our systems that go into hospital facilities and operating rooms in order to transmit high quality video in a bi-directional way. They are also used to transmit high resolution medical images from CT scans, MR scans, and a wide variety of medical imaging devices that are on the market today. Of course, this same ISDN technology can be used in business and government to transmit training programs and all types of meetings, large image files, and other presentation materials. There are also always-on technologies for bandwidth. And we've talked a little bit about satellite telecommunications technologies that allow transmission from small data rates for things like credit card transactions and credit card verification to multi-megabit capabilities for broadcast television. There are also cable modems, which not only allow for the transmission of video, but also for data transmission anywhere between 128 kilobits per second and 3 megabits per second. Similar to cable is digital subscriber line technology, DSL technology. It allows transmission between 384 kilobits and 1.5 and megabits. Now, what does all this mean? Well, what it means is that compression devices using the international standards allow transmission using this greater availability of bandwidth 
to produce high quality audio, video, still images, and text images to a wide variety of devices, both wired and wireless. Now let's take a little let's talk a little bit about a couple of case studies. These case studies again are in the healthcare area. They're based on two customer projects that we've worked on in just the past year. These are ongoing projects, but I think they are indicative of the types of things that are available and the types of opportunities that are available, not only in the healthcare sector, but also in the government and commercial sectors. The first one I'd like to talk about is the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, CHLA. CHLA is the number one pediatric trauma center in Los Angeles County. Children that are injured in accidents come into the CHLA center from all around Los Angeles. And what CHLA was finding is that these children would be trans transported via helicopter with very little additional information for the intensivists at CHLA. And many times the transport was either unnecessary or it was actually detrimental to providing quality care. What CHLA asked Stryker Communications to do was to create a network that would give much more information on the status of that injured child prior to transport. Up until this point, they had simply used a phone call and maybe a fax back and forth for information. What we did was set up a high-speed network using the IP transmission standard in order to transmit video and audio in a bi-directional way. So now, instead of just talking on the phone with an emergency room doctor at one of the remote hospitals, the intensivists at Children's LA could see and hear both the doctor and the patient. Furthermore, much of the healthcare information regarding that patient could now be transmitted. This new network transmits electronic stethoscope data, for instance, and it also transmits the hemodynamics information on the patient like blood pressure, pulse rate, respiration, and that kind of thing. It also transmits x-rays. As you can see, this technology allowed for the sharing of a great deal more information than could be gathered simply from a phone call. This is all made possible by the convergence of these devices and the application of the international standards that have become ubiquitous. Use of these technologies enhances CHLA's reputation as an innovator, and it also makes it much easier on patients' relatives because they're no longer required to travel from the outlying areas of Los Angeles County to downtown Los Angeles to visit a child who's been injured. The economic and social impacts on the community have been great. CHLA is saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in helicopter transport costs. The quality of patient care is better, and the end result is that children's lives are saved. The next case study I'd like to talk about is an interesting one. It involved the Hospital de Beneficence in Pignon, Haiti. This community has nowhere near the infrastructure capabilities that are available in Los Angeles. What Stryker is doing there is setting up a two-way satellite link between a couple of operating rooms in Pignon, Haiti and operating rooms in Minnesota. Pignon is a very poor part of Haiti, located on the central plateau, and healthcare there is virtually non-existent. So the economic requirements were great. What is happening as a result of the installation of this linkage? What we're finding was that not only is healthcare around the small Pignon area positively affected, but also healthcare throughout Haiti. Because now the wealthy Haitians who live in Port-au-Prince and who traditionally traveled to Miami for the health, their health care are traveling to Pignon for world-class health care. This was the brainchild of Dr. Guy Theodore, who practices in Pignon, and Dr. Paul Severson from Minnesota. Dr. Severson is from Mercy Hospital in Moose Lake, Minnesota. The two-way satellite video system can link the operating rooms in both facilities so that when Dr. Severson is operating in Minnesota, and Dr. Theodore is, is operating in Pignon, they can actually collaborate and show each other their patients and show each other different types of procedures or different approaches to procedures. The end result is not only beneficial to the patients where their health is concerned, but is also financially beneficial 
to the village of Pignon. What I've tried to do with the examples I've just given you is to crystallize in your minds several key ideas. Think about the problem you're trying to solve from a business and not a technology perspective. Telecommunications technology and technology in general can be very intoxicating. Many of us like technology and like to play with technology. But we always have to remember that there needs to be a purpose, a strategy behind what we're doing with technology, or it won't work. Once you've worked through your business problem and you've really defined what that problem is that you're trying to solve, select a vendor or consultant that understands both the business problem and the technology, not simply the technology. I've seen so many projects over the years where the technology takes the forefront, and that should not be the case. It should always be the underlying business strategy or business purpose that takes the forefront. Select a vendor that understands this and then use the competitive procurement process. I found the competitive procurement process works best if you approach it in a less structured manner and allow vendors to be creative in solving your organization's specific problem. If you take this approach, you will end up with a system that works from both an organizational and a technology perspective. Just a couple of tips on vendor selection. A vendor's experience and references are key. Make sure they have worked in your vertical market and make sure that they have recent relevant experience. Technology changes very quickly, so really look at the experience of the vendors and check their references. We've talked a little bit about technical understanding. Obviously, if an organization is in the process of implementing this technology, its people have got to have a technical understanding of what it is they're trying to do. But again, there must be that understanding of the problem that they're trying to solve. It's also important to look at the work processes that are going to be affected and the people that are going to be involved in using the system once it's implemented. Also look closely at the financial strength of a vendor. Financial strength is very important because if things go wrong, and typically in integration projects, there are bumps in the road that all projects need to get over. The financial strength of the vendor can certainly make it more likely that any problem that arises will be solved successfully. Make sure that quality is built into the organization. Our organization, for instance, adheres to ISO 9001 standard and its healthcare offshoot, which is the ISO 13485 standard. The ISO quality standards really build a framework around making sure that quality processes are in place to turn out the product that your organization is looking for. Look at location. Your consultant or vendor should probably be close by. That's not a requirement, but it makes it a lot easier in terms of communicating what the organization's needs are and in understanding what problem is being solved by implementing the system. Also look for in-house resources. Many companies, if they're small, will hire outside consultants to handle different parts of a project. This is fine. However, organizations with in-house resources are typically much better coordinated than vendors which subcontract many of the important facets of a project. Once you've talked with the vendors and gone through each of these things, make sure that you have a solid proposal and a contract with the vendor that delineates a clear understanding of what the responsibilities are for both the vendor and the customer. Well, there you have it. A lot of information in a short period of time, and I apologize for that. But hopefully there are some key points in there that will help you in terms of understanding the convergence of telecommunications and in selecting a vendor to handle your communications integration projects. Just some final words. The truly successful implementations of new technology are the ones that solve a business problem or streamline a business process in a sustainable and evolvable way. Make sure that you're solving an organizational or business problem, that you are streamlining a process, and that you're doing it in such a way that it's not technology dependent, and that it can evolve and adapt and change through time. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Rick. And now we're going to continue with our second question and answer session. And we have a caller from Mexico from the uh, Instituto Politécnico Nacional uh, Educación uh, Continua in Mexico. Go ahead, please. <laughs> 